In this presentation, we're going to discuss some of the complications we may encounter with fracture repair surgery. If we're undertaking fracture repairs, then it's important that we know the potential complications that can arise. And if we understand why complications have occurred, then we will be better placed to prevent them happening again in future surgeries. Almost all orthopaedic complications encountered will be caused by the surgeon. Implant failure, for example, the breaking of a plate, loosening or snapping of cerclage wire, or migration of an IM pin, are not down to faults with the metal implant, but incorrect use of the implant by the surgeon. As I said right at the beginning of the talk, Orthopaedic surgery can be very unforgiving, but if we stick closely to the rules and principles, then we can dramatically reduce our chances of encountering serious complications. Complications in orthopaedic surgeries are not just a case of a wound needing resutured. They often lead to a failure of a fracture to heal and the necessity for that limb to be amputated. We'll discuss initially the main complications that occur directly related to the surgery itself, and then at the end, I'll chat briefly about using external coaption as an alternative to surgery for fracture repair. And the reason I've included external coaption in this complications section is that I've probably seen as many complications associated with it as I have cases that have done well with it. The images here, although not of IM pins or external skeletal fixation, illustrate the catastrophic consequences of implant failures. The plated femoral fracture on the left has failed due to incorrect use of plating technology for this particular type of fracture. And the tibia on the right has failed partly due to a lack of owner compliance, but partly due to a fracture developing through an unseen drill hole underneath the plate. The main complications we're concerned about include infection. And here we're talking about surgical site infections, that is, Infection occurs after the surgery in the area where the surgery was performed. Failure of the fixation mechanically, for example, loosening, migrating and breaking of implants. Bony delayed unions, non-unions and malunions. Iatrogenic fractures and fracture disease. This is usually young animals involving the quadriceps muscle groups. Surgical site infections. We discussed these when we were talking about the importance of asepsis, but we'll cover the major points again because it is so important to minimise the risk of an SSI. SSIs are defined as occurring up to 30 days of a surgical procedure, but up to a year of the procedure if we have placed implants. So that clearly is us. This will represent a real problem for us since many of our patients will have long returned to the streets by then. Classical symptoms of an SSI are redness, swelling, pain and a discharge. The discharge does not have to be purulent to indicate infection. It may appear grossly as a simple serous discharge. And the image on the left here is a discharging sinus arising from implant associated infection in the proximal tibia of a dog. And this image on the right is every orthopaedic surgeon's nightmare. Surgical site infections are more likely to occur in the following situations. Contaminated surgical sites, either open fractures or through poor asepsis. You could convert a clean surgical site, such as a closed fracture, to a contaminated site with poor asepsis. So attention to detail with patient, surgeon and operating area sterility is crucial. SSIs due to poor asepsis are preventable. Prolonged anaesthetics and prolonged surgical procedures. Both will increase the chances of infection, so perform the procedure in an efficient manner, have everything looked out and sterilised in advance, and proceed quickly from prep to surgery. Have a plan A and a plan B before surgery begins. Prolonged general anaesthesia means that the patient is in an immunocompromised situation for longer, which will predispose to infection. Immunocompromised patients this is quite likely in our situation with undernourished street dogs with parasite and other disease burdens. Older animals will have a poorer immune response to infections, as will those with underlying diseases such as hypothyroidism, diabetes, renal and hepatic disease, etc. Poor surgical technique. We need to adhere closely to Halstead's principles. They should always be present at the forefront of our minds as surgeons and surgeon experience should be associated with reduced infection risk.
quick reminder of Halstead's principles, since these are crucial to surgical success in all areas, not just orthopaedics. Gentle tissue handling, meticulous hemostasis, preservation of blood supply, strict aseptic technique, minimum tension on tissues, accurate apposition of tissues, and obliteration of dead space. Infection can be introduced before surgery, such as with an open fracture, during surgery or after surgery. Post-operative sources of infection include poor kennel cleanliness and the animal being able to lick its surgical wound. Pay good attention to the post-op phase, since there's little point in obeying all the surgical rules and then allowing the patient to be transported to a dirty kennel or placed on a filthy x-ray plate for post-op x-rays. Cover the surgical wound with a cheap adhesive dressing immediately after surgery if you've got these for 24 hours at least. Use buster collars, inflatable collars or some form of clothing, old t-shirts, shorts etc. to prevent the patient getting at your surgical wound. I'm not sure whether the cat here is going to be prevented at getting at our ESF pins with a collar like that, but I'm certain that this guy up here is getting nothing with this on. How do we diagnose and treat surgical site infections in our situations? Diagnosis ideally would be based upon bacterial culture and sensitivity from a swab sent to an external laboratory. Now this will be expensive and quite possibly not an option where we are working. So the next best thing would be cytology if you've got access to a microscope. Make a slide and stay in it. You're looking for significant numbers of neutrophils and degenerate neutrophils. Now I'm far from being a cytologist, so you'll need to refer to texts for more information here, but a microscope can be a real friend when there's ac no access to external labs. Failing that, go on the clinical signs in front of you. For example, inflammation, pain, swelling, and discharge. Here is a basic microscope with an attachment that allows us to view the image on the screen, allowing several people to look at things at the same time and discuss what they see. Increased numbers of neutrophils suggest an inflammatory response, and the presence of degenerate neutrophils strongly points towards bacterial infection. Bacterial toxins cause the neutrophils to degenerate. In the centre of the middle image here is a degenerating neutrophil with the presence of bacterial cocci within it. And on the right is a slide showing massive numbers of degenerate neutrophils. Treatment of surgical site infections. The first thing to say is that we should always wear gloves, sterile if possible, when managing these wounds. The last thing we want to do is to introduce additional nosocomial infection, that is hospital-based bacteria, to the situation. Clean and cover the wound with a sterile absorbent primary layer dressing. In the absence of bacterial swab results, start intravenous broad-spectrum antibiotics such as cefiroxim or amoxicillin clavulanate at appropriate doses and intervals. I tend to use Zinicef or cefiroxim at 20 mg per kilogram three times a day. If you have the luxury of lab results, you can alter the antibiotics used accordingly when the results come in. Superficial infections, such as those seen with external skeletal fixation pin exit points, I would treat for about seven days, but deeper infections at the level of the bone and implants will require much longer courses of up to six weeks. It's important to say here that implant associated infection will usually only completely clear up on removal of the implants. Some bacteria, such as staphylococci, create a glycocalyx biofilm in association with implants, which protects them from the action of the antibiotics. The fracture will heal in the presence of infection, so long as it remains stable. It's just that we will need to remove these implants once the bone is healed in order to get rid of the infection. Implant failure. Here I mean either mechanical failure of the implant due to it breaking or functional failure due to it slipping or migrating, etc. As already mentioned, implants usually fail due to poor application rather than a fault with the implant itself. With the types of fixation we are using, it would be unusual to see an intermodellary pin break. It would be more likely if the fracture is unstable, the IM pin will migrate. If this happens prior to healing, then we will get a complete breakdown of our repair. Cerclage wires will slip either if they're not tightened properly 
or if they're placed around a fracture that is not fully reconstructed, resulting in it collapsing and the wires then becoming redundant. We've spoken about the hazards of placing wires on bone that is tapering or not circular in diameter earlier. External skeletal fixation pins can pull out if they're not inserted properly, for example using smooth tipped trocar pins inserted perpendicular to the long axis of the bone, or not having enough pins per segment resulting in fracture instability and premature pin loosening. Tension band repair implants could fail if not strong enough to counteract the forces at play. And both snapping of the figure eight tension band and snapping or bending of the arthrodesis wires are possible. Migration of arthrodesis wires is also possible if the fracture is unstable or if they're not inserted properly. Similarly, arthrodesis wires used to repair growth plate fractures could snap or bend if they're exposed to forces greater than they can handle. If you've got a metal implant on x-ray that has snapped in two, it looks like it snapped in two, then this is likely to represent chronic cyclic overloading of the implant up to a point when it gives up, meaning it wasn't strong enough to do the job in the first place. If you have a metal implant on x-ray that appears to have bent, then that is likely to represent one immediate large force that has caused the deformation, for example, jumping from a height. This implant may have been strong enough to do the job under normal weight bearing circumstances, but was exposed to an unusually massive force. Although not dealing with plates and screws in this talk, I thought this would be a good image to include to illustrate that if we apply the wrong type of implant for the fracture, then mechanical failure is a real possibility. Here, a plate has been applied to a distal femoral fracture. The surgeon has adopted a biological approach, bridging the fracture site and not aiming for accurate reconstruction and primary or direct bony healing. Unfortunately, the plate chosen is far too short and has acted as a stress riser or concentrator. The plate has been cyclically overloaded and is fractured through an empty screw hole. To repair this type of fracture using a biological osteosynthesis approach, a much longer plate should have been employed which would have been able to handle the micro motion at the fracture site. The plate here is too short and too stiff. It will not allow enough micro motion for secondary indirect bony healing to occur, but it's not stiff enough to counteract the forces acting at the fracture site. Had the bony column been fully reconstructed beneath the plate and more screw holes filled, then this might have worked. Delayed union, non-union and malunion. A delayed union occurs when the bone is healing well, but just not in the timescale we would expect. It's taking longer than we would expect to heal. It should go on to heal eventually, as long as the implants that we've used can provide stability for long enough. If it looks like this is not the case, then revision surgery may be required, depending on the reason for the delayed union. Circumstances that can predispose to the delayed healing of a fracture would include age, Older animals have a poorer healing capability. Ill health. Animals with other underlying diseases have a poorer capacity for healing. Infection. Untreated infection at the fracture site will increase healing times. And the type of repair and method of healing. Primary bone healing, such as you get with plates and screws, takes a lot longer than secondary bone healing that you would get with IM pins, ESFs, etc. And finally, fracture biology. A bone that has minimal soft tissue covering or that's lost a lot of soft tissue attachments at the time of trauma or surgery may experience delayed healing. Extremely delayed unions and non-unions can be difficult to differentiate from one another and we rely on serial x-rays taken over many weeks. This obviously is unlikely to be available in our situations, but we will cover the theory regardless. A non-union occurs when the bone has failed to heal and it will not do so without further intervention. There are two basic types of non-union, biologically active or hypertrophic non-unions and biologically inactive or atrophic non-unions. Hypertrophic non-unions are situations where there's a good blood supply but not enough stability for bone to form. Often excess fibrous callus formation occurs. Atrophic non-unions are avascular situations and these represent a real challenge to surgeons. There will be no callus formation at all here. Hypertrophic non-union. 
These situations can be resolved often by stabilising the fracture and creating an environment for secondary or indirect healing to occur. And remember we need interfragmentary strain to be less than 10% for new bone to form. In our scenario, this can only be achieved by either adding an ESF construct to, for example, a fractured long bone with an IM pin, or strengthening one that is already there. Adding additional pins to an existing ESF that is using epoxy putty rather than clamps can be a challenge, unfortunately. In an ideal situation, the application of a bone plate would be warranted in these situations. If the hypertrophic non-union is chronic or there is malalignment of the fracture ends, then it will be necessary to resect the fibrous tissue, freshen up the bone ends, reduce the fracture gap as much as possible and re-stabilise using a plate and screws in the ideal world. Once again, amputation would probably be the simplest solution in all but the most basic of cases. Biologically inactive or atrophic non-unions are not viable and require revision surgery. They are very likely to develop in any situation where there is a fracture gap of over one and a half times the diameter of the bone, where there is no blood supply to the fracture site, where fragments are present with no blood supply, which become necrotic and infected, and then there are the inherent atrophic non-unions that we see, for example, in the distal third of the radius of toy breeds. On x-ray of an atrophic non-union, the bone will look very inert, poorly calcified, there will be no callus formation, there may be sequestra present, there might be a fracture gap and the ends of the long bones may appear sclerotic and rounded. Treatment of atrophic unions in our situation will mean limb amputation. Surgery to salvage an atrophic non-union is complex and involves reaming the medullary canals, using bone grafts and applying dynamic compression to the fracture site usually. This image on the right originally had a plate on it but developed a non-union. So revision surgery was done and a rigid external skeletal fixation device was used. And this image was taken many weeks after the ESF placement showing there is still no real evidence of bone healing. The ESF was too stiff to allow callus development. In our situation, this would require amputation, although this animal did eventually go on to heal after a third major surgery. A malunion is where the bone has healed in the expected time, but in an abnormal position. And this is what happens to most fractures if we don't attempt to recreate the normal anatomy surgically. The case shown here is of an unstable distal tibial fracture that was repaired with a hybrid external fixator and a single interfragmentary lag screw. We can see on this lateral view that the tibia is not perfectly straight. There's a caudal bowing of the distal tibia here. Now sometimes we will get away with this, but sometimes it will cause ongoing chronic lameness. At the time of surgery, try to get as good alignment of the bone as possible, and this can be particularly challenging with ESFs, so take some time to get this correct. We want long bones to have normal length restored as well as both rotational and angular alignment. A slight degree of long bone deformity is acceptable, but if we stray too far from the normal, then the bone will be predisposed to repeat fracture once the implants have been removed. And this individual did indeed get a further tibial fracture at the site of the deformity here several months after the bone had healed and had the ESF removed. It ended up with a hind limb amputation, something that may have been avoided had we achieved better angular alignment in this plane at the time of the original surgery. Iatrogenic fractures, that is, fractures caused by our surgery and our use of implants. These can occur at the time of surgery or many weeks or months later. An example of this type of injury occurring during surgery would be a fracture developing, developing along a fissure line due to the placement of an ESF pin within that fissure. Also, trying to drill a positive threaded pin into bone without pre-drilling could result in fracture. Negative thread pins officially don't need to be pre-drilled, but I often do. Another example could be the fracturing of the avulse fragment of bone when trying to repair an avulsion fracture with an arthrodesis wire and figure of eight tension band. Examples of iatrogenic fractures occurring after surgery would be, for example, through the pinhole after removal of an ESF, or through the hole drilled for the figure of eight tension band wire in an avulsion fracture repair. Don't drill this hole right next to the cortex, but rather perhaps 
about a third of the way across the diameter of the bone. Another example would be iatrogenic fractures at the end of a plate where the plate is too short for the bone and this area acts as a stress riser. If you're in any doubt about bone strength after implant removal, then use external co-action for a short while and restrict activity for a number of weeks. Take extreme care during surgery to adhere to all the principles we've discussed regarding the correct use of the implants and this will help minimise both intraoperative and postoperative iatrogenic fractures. An example from me, I once created an iatrogenic fracture during a femoral head and neck osteotomy surgery. A poorly positioned osteotome cut resulted in a femoral fracture, a long bone fracture, which I then had to repair once the osteotomy had been completed. Now this is a 100% surgeon error, and it's not a difficult thing to do if we do not pay very close attention to our anatomical landmarks. This is the image from the title slide of this talk, and this dog had a procedure called a cranial closing wedge osteotomy performed to treat cranial cruciate ligament rupture. And it basically involves taking a wedge of bone from the proximal tibia and closing the defect with a metal plate and screws. Now this case wasn't rested post-operatively, but there's also a very strong suspicion that the fracture repair failed due to surgeon error. And what you can just see here, this tiny wee black mark here, there is a small hole in the bone where the orthopaedic wire was used to maintain reduction whilst the plate was applied. Now this hole is placed too far caudally and too near the hole used for the plate screw. It should have been much nearer the cranial cortis of the tibia, somewhere round about here, and it's likely that the two holes in close proximity were enough to weaken the bone and cause it to fracture during load bearing, resulting in a complete breakdown of our repair. Now, it may not look like much on the x-ray, but this was completely unstable with this whole proximate segment rocking backwards. So how do, you repair, how do we repair this? There's not enough normal bone in the distal segment to apply another plate because the fracture had propagated distally through all the screw holes. We applied cerclage wires to reconstruct the fissure fracture extending distally down the tibial shaft and applied a type 1B external skeletal fixation construct with three positive threaded half pins in each segment. So altogether we had four half pins on the medial aspect of the tibia and two on the cranial aspect. And the aim here was to encourage secondary or indirect bony healing and so the two connecting bars were not joined in order to make sure that this construct was not too stiff. This osteotomy went on to heal well, thankfully. You will see that on the craniocaudal view here on the right, we've created a slight angular malalignment with the proximal tibial segment tilted laterally. This will lead to a slight malunion, as we've just discussed, but not enough to create problems in this case. External coaption. This is the final thing I want to discuss, and right at the start I'll declare that I'm probably the worst leg bandager in the world. I will inevitably leave all dressing to our nurses. It's true that when I qualified in the late 1980s, I worked with some older vets who were absolutely superb at reducing fractures closed and applying plaster of Paris casts. But this is a skill long gone with advances in internal fixation in most practices in the UK, or at least the ability to, re to refer to someone who can perform it. Plaster of Paris is not used now, having been superseded by the many synthetic casting materials that are lighter, easier to work with and less messy. The advantages of external coaption are that it can be cheap, it's simple and rapid to use and it avoids the risks associated with surgery of potential damage to soft tissue and nerves etc. The list of disadvantages is significantly longer. We can't use external coaption above the stifle or elbow joints. It causes immobilization of normal joints. It's not applicable for open fractures. External coaption can be associated also with significant soft tissue problems, including pressure sores, erythema and skin ulceration. There is an inability to be able to stabilize the fracture ends. And despite appearances, external coaption needs very careful monitoring for problems such as slippage, and swelling of the distal extremities. Dressings will need regular changing, sometimes under sedation, which actually makes this option not as cheap as it would seem, especially if dressing changes are increased due to soiling or the dressing getting wet. The only situations where I would elect for external coaption over internal fixation of a fracture 
would be in very young patients with minimally displaced or green stick fractures of the tibia or radius where the fibula and ulna are intact to provide support. I would also use it for most toe fractures and metacarpal or metatarsal fractures unless all four bones were fractured and displaced. Even with one intact metacarpal or metatarsal bone, external coaption can be successful. I'm not going to get into the details of how to apply dressings, etc. This is covered in a talk I've done on traumatic wound care in the street dog population, so if you want more information, you can find it there. These are a couple of the very few cases where I would consider external coaption as an alternative to internal fixation. Both are puppies with mid-shaft tibial fractures. Neither is massively displaced, although we only have one x-ray view of this one, so we can't really make that call here. The pup on the left looks to be around eight weeks old looking at the growth plates, whereas the one on the right is perhaps near 12 weeks of age. Both fractures felt reasonably stable, probably helped by the thickened periosteum possessed by puppies. Being below the stifle joint, external coaption is an option, and with the age of these puppies, we are looking at a matter of perhaps three to four weeks for healing to occur. We have to accept, though, that some axial or rotational malalignment may be a consequence. Using implants on very young bone can be fraught with problems, since the bone may simply not be hard enough to hold the implants. We also do not want to use IM pins that may damage the growth plates. Over the last 20 years or so, I've tended to apply external skeletal fixation constructs instead of dressings to supply support for the fracture repairs if it were needed. And these can be used to cross a joint for the treatment of severe ligament injuries too, but that's for another talk. Both of these individuals had significant multi-ligament injuries that were treated with transarticular external skeletal fixators. On the left is a dog with severe tarsal ligament disruption, and here is a cat that had suffered a stifled derangement injury involving both cranial and caudal cruciate ligaments and the lateral collateral ligament. That brings us to the end of these talks on fracture repair in street dog populations, and I hope some of this information will be useful to you. I'll leave you with a couple of landscapes which are not too dissimilar. On the left are the Black Coolan Mountains on the Isle of Skye in Scotland, and on the right we've got Mount Meru in Tanzania. <laughs>